Human-computer interaction is a, is a research field that sits in the intersection between computer science, engineering, design, and human factors. Uh, um, we study um, what's going on in the intersection between uh, human beings and technology. We look at how humans use technology from, a, uh, from in terms of perception, cognition, in terms of social behaviors, so that we inform the design of technologies that are more usable, user-friendly, as some people say, and that can actually augment individuals, individuals in their capacities uh, rather than continue designing systems that can only be used by other technologists. Thank you. And, and what is it that brought you into, into this world of you know, digital technology and, and information? Well, I've always been so attracted by technologies. So I started playing with uh, hardware and software um, quite early. I used to be um, at, uh, a journalist uh, mm -hmm. over 12 years ago, and I was writing about technology. And I realized that this was going to totally transform society and it could just have such an impact in basically everything that we do. And I thought rather than talking about how others uh, create technology, I want to be uh, someone who is heavily involved in the design and, and study of new systems. So I left the newspaper where I used to work and I pursued a career that ended up with a PhD in computer science and then with me being very involved in technology and society projects. Thank you. And I know you are also the CEO of Ideas for Change, which is an innovation agency that advises cities and companies. Um, so could you tell us a bit more about what you do there and, and why? So Ideas for Change, it's a, it's a very particular company. We do uh, consultancy and research. And basically, we are very focused in understanding uh, what happens in the intersection between new technologies and social change, how technology is changing society. And our approach is to study this all the time so that we can anticipate these changes and propose uh, new approaches, new systems, new products that lead to a better society. Um, this kind of comes from the realization that a lot of what's going on is us reacting to the fear uh, of uh, the changes that technology is bringing into our society. We don't want to be reactive, we want to propose because we think that a better society is possible, but we just need to anticipate these changes and channel society and technology in a way that we can achieve uh, positive outcomes. So for the last uh, 20 years, we have seen how technologies have been embedded into our everyday lives. Everything that we do is mediated with technology. We wear technologies that collect uh, data about our body and our experiences. We use mobile phones, we do online searches, and moreover, our cities have become uh, packed with sensor technologies. And these technologies are collecting data all the time. And this data is being used by uh, companies and, and, and governments to make sense of our behaviors, uh, of what we do individually and collectively. And obviously, if you don't know what data is being collected and what data is saying about you and your patterns, then you're at risk of being surveilled or controlled, which is um, incredibly problematic. The problem is that yet it, had been, uh, it has been stated, but it cannot be uh, totally um, implemented. I mean, you go to your city council and ask them to give you all the data they, they have of you mm -hmm. in an interoperable and readable system format. Mm -hmm. This is not happening. I mean, like, we need to move beyond stating new rights mm -hmm. into infrastructuring new rights so that we can really enact our new agency. And this is a technological, legal, and social challenge. So Mara, coming back to the topic, we have explored some of the risk uh, that this uncontrolled expansion of information about us and about how we behave um, have uh, in our society. But we also know that there are abundant opportunities that you know, raise uh, from this issue and that citizens can you know, use this information and technologies to address some of the, of the problems that they might uh, have in their cities. And I think you have a great example from Barcelona that you could share with us. 
I absolutely believe that when people have access to producing and governing their data, their agendas move forward. And this is a way to go. I mean, not causing uh, fear and, and paralyzing people, but rather opening up opportunities for people to gather the potential of data and move on their agendas. The case of uh, the, um, we have this great um, opportunity to work with citizens in, living in a square in the city of Barcelona. It's known as, uh, it's called Plaza del Sol. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, a place where citizens have been complaining for years mm -hmm. of noise pollution uh, in, the, in the area. And um, we, working with them, we co-created uh, 25 um, open source sensors mm -hmm. uh, building on the Smart Citizen Kit technology. Mm -hmm. And we deployed them, the 25 sensors, in the balconies mm -hmm. of the residents living around the square. Mm -hmm. And for six weeks, they collected noise data 24 hours a day, every five seconds. This created the data commons on, of noise pollution on the, on the square, uh, the largest one ever created. Mm -hmm. This data demonstrated that they did not have a perception of noise pollution, but actually the noise levels in the square were way beyond what's uh, recommended by the World Health Organization mm -hmm. and also beyond what is established by the local legislation. So with this data, mm -hmm. citizens have the opportunity to sit with the city council and negotiate changes in the architecture and in the cleaning protocols and in the use of the square mm -hmm. that were aimed at alleviating the problem of noise pollution. In this case, citizens were part of um, assembling the sensor technology so that they understand what is a sensor, how it works, collecting the data governing the data together that is um, co-creating a protocol in, that says who can access to this data under which conditions and, and also using this data in a way that benefits them. And I would love the audience to be able to see some of the photos of this project. I think we have some and that we will be showing in a sec. Um, so what can we see in this photo? So in Mara? this picture you see Rosa and, and her daughter assembling a smart citizen kit this is an open source uh, Arduino at heart uh, technology and they are going to take this sensor and, and install it in their balconies uh, so that this sensor starts to relate uh, noise data. Um, in the next picture we have citizens uh, making sense of data. This is super important. Mm -hmm. Most people have never seen what sensor data looks like, mm -hmm. leave alone, I mean, trying to make sense of it. So in this project, we looked at different ways in which we could um, advance people's data literacy mm -hmm. by showing them what the data looks like in very tangible ways mm -hmm. and creating tools for people to analyze the data themselves. In this, in this exact moment, they are analyzing the sensor data and they are realizing that they can prove that noise levels definitely go up at the times in which they are supposed to be sleeping, mm -hmm. which proves that they're having uh, this, this, these noise levels are affecting their sleep patterns. And I've heard that you, you have not only done this in Barcelona, right? You have also had pilots in other cities. Uh, was there uh, any difference between the results in, in different cities? Yes, the Making Sense project um, uh, was um, led by VAG Society in Amsterdam and uh, I did it when I was working at Fab Lab Barcelona and we deployed nine pilots, three in the Netherlands, three in Kosovo and three in Spain, focusing on noise pollution, gamma radiation and air quality. In Kosovo, for example, uh, the pilots also rendered really interesting results. One of them was this, the, reaching the point uh, to which, uh, at which a, a new policy for air quality was discussed in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So this really shows that when people have the uh, capacity to produce data, mm -hmm. to control the data, to make sense of the, the, the data, they can use it in ways that create public benefit. Oh, this, this is an amazing example. And uh, do you have uh, any other projects that you are working at the moment uh, you know, that uh, also show the potential of this opportunity? I have uh, a number of yeah. other projects. Um, one, for example, is called Denosis. Denosis mm -hmm. is a project that um, encourages people to map odors. Mm -hmm. Odors in cities 
tend to be indicators of, of other uh, sustainability problems. In this, and but. Sensing odor is very difficult. Mm -hmm. In fact, the best sensor for odor that's ever invented is mm -hmm. our nose. Mm -hmm. So uh, the technology in the nose is actually helps people to use their nose mm -hmm. to uh, map no, no, uh, odors mm -hmm. in a way that is compatible to how scientists would investigate this. Uh, and therefore, it allows for creating huge evidence that combined with data of the environment and the wind direction and so on allows to identify who is the other emitter. Mm -hmm. And this really helps to tackle these problems at the city level. We have 10 pilots across the world. We also have another project called Cities Health. Mm -hmm. This is a SWAFS project funded by the European Commission. We have five pilots and what we're doing here for the first time is not just collect environmental data mm -hmm. on air quality and noise pollution, but actually collect how people are exposed to these pollutants and how their health data can show effects of this pollution in their well-being. So this is the first time where citizens are informing uh, a research protocol entirely, co-creating the research question, mm -hmm. collecting the data that is environmental and their health data, mm -hmm. and analyzing the, the results and assessing what to do with these results, either policy change or uh, more um, uh, tangible actions at the urban level. Okay, so I, I was actually going to ask you about the consequences of, you know, of doing things this way. Um, do, do people change their behavior when they know uh, the information that is you know, being uh, yes, collected about them? Absolutely. It is very interesting to see how when people start uh, co-creating these technologies, making sense of data, they become aware of how much is at stake <laughs> when it comes to data, how much can be learned about data. For example, I remember uh, people working, living at the Plaza del Sol mm -hmm. when they had the noise sensors, mm -hmm. they would realize that only by showing the data uh, if you, they were saying so much about their personal life. For example, if I'm at home or I'm not at home because I'm making noise or not. Mm -hmm. But actually, things that you may be doing at night mm -hmm. at certain times and with certain frequency mm -hmm. can also be identified in the noise data. So having people participate in this sort of data project makes them definitely more aware of data, how it is collected, what it means, and also the huge potential that it has when it is in hands of people. And how do we ensure that citizens make good use of this of this data and this technology? I think uh, there is a project that you've been working on called Decode, in which we also have some photos uh, that we can share. And yeah, could you say some of the what are the, the tools that you can use uh, in order to make this process uh, better? Data governance is a huge uh, it's a huge field of study right now. Uh, so basically, what we're looking at is in which ways citizens can come together as a collective or even individually and govern the, their data. So what we're seeing here is a workshop where we were discussing with different uh, people under which conditions they would be willing to share sensor data. And uh, what then, what we did is after reaching agreement, we, um, we created, well, the, the Decode uh, technology team created these technologies that allow for people to apply these preferences mm -hmm. as smart contracts on top of the data. Um, the way it was done, I think there was another picture showing this, mm -hmm. the way it was done is basically in their mobile phone, uh, citizens have their uh, sovereign identity, their mm -hmm. identity, right? Yeah. Because you need to, to be able to say that the data that this sensor produces is yours mm -hmm. so that you can govern this data. You need to pair it with something that identifies you, right? Mm -hmm. So this was held, this identity was held in the mobile phone. The mobile phone is paired with the sensor and then these this combinations of um, attributes on how people have agreed to share the sensor data can be enacted through smart contracts. So what is happening here is that this person, in this case Lucia, who you see in the picture, mm -hmm. will install the sensor at her house and the sensor will be collecting air quality, noise pollution data and this data is going to be shared mm -hmm. as the community had agreed to share it. For example, it's aggregated mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and it can and it's anonymized for the general public. However, the city council can see it with a um, with more granularity, and uh, uh, members of the same sensor community can see all the data without it being anonymized, etc. So it shows how people can apply different layers of governance uh, to the data, and how this um, it kind of shows us an ecosystem where people have more agency over the data and can decide how to share their data uh, with different stakeholders for different reasons and then also change those settings as they believe uh, when, when they think they have to. Thank you, Mara, for sharing these two great examples. Um, we actually have a question coming from Twitter uh, from Claire, who is saying that uh, this seems like quite small scale. Uh, do you think it offers a genuine alternative to the technology monopolies who have access to, to data of hundreds of, of millions of people? I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, there are other projects uh, currently being done uh, with data on a larger scale, mm -hmm. uh, for example, to advance uh, treatments and for Alzheimer or for cancer. But in this, uh, um, so there are other things being done. Mm -hmm. But um, the projects that I just described are uh, experimental situated uh, projects that have the, the size uh, that they need to have for the uh, goals that they want to achieve. So for the ones on, on very specific pollution cases and so on, we're interested in working in very situated contexts. However, we do need to scale up. Mm -hmm. And for this, we need to discuss some very important challenges, such as data infrastructures and, and, and how to do this in the large scale. The truth is that a huge percentage of the data that we produce in Europe ends up mm -hmm. in the Americas, mm -hmm. and that we do not have the capacity to establish uh, uh, standards and protocols. So if we want to scale up, we need to solve scalability problems, and we need to discuss data infrastructures because otherwise uh, it is absolutely true we remain at the very local level.